Hello, I'm Justine Whittaker, and I'm Senior Lecturer at the University of Central Lancashire. I'm Director and Nurse Consultant at Northern Lymphology in Lancashire, and I'm also a very active member of the British Lymphology Society Scientific Committee. Thank you for taking time today to listen to our presentations in Lymphedema Awareness Week. Over the next 15 minutes, I want to talk to you about how to get it right first time when we start to consider prescribing garments for patients who require compression. Hopefully throughout this presentation, I aim to give you the following objectives. I want you to understand how garments are made so that they can, uh, so we can understand the tensions and the pressures that they exert. What to consider when uh, choosing an appropriate garment how to measure correctly for the garment that you've chosen that you want for your patient. Know how to fill in a prescription um, form and, and how that process works currently. Also then to be aware of the different application systems to make sure that the patients or the carers are able to apply the compression garments on a daily basis as you require them to. It's important to understand what the aftercare of a garment is um, for patients and carers to know and how to look after them and also to have a little insight to the challenges ahead uh, as things change rapidly at the moment within the National Health Service. So the first two questions we need to ask ourselves are how do we choose what type of compression we want to prescribe? Well in order to do that we need to have an understanding how garments um, deliver their pressures and what sort of tension they have within the material. So let's delve into this a little deeper. The pressures and tensions within a garment are, are kind of 50-50 really. But when we come to prescribing garments or we want to um, think about which we're going to put patients in, is it a class one, a class two or a class three uh, or four, whichever one you decide, that really is only half of the prescription. But that's what we see on the box. That's what we see on the um, formularies for us to prescribe. What I want you to understand is that the other half of that prescription is how strong the materials are and the tension within them um, with, with each different product that's available. So there's a rather little crude drawing here just to your side that's um, depicted in yellow and purple. And the yellow line is the body of the yarn. And this is what um, creates the loops within um, within the weave and weft of a garment. And this is what creates the thickness or the stiffness of the product that you're going to be applying. And this is the bit that's not on the tin, if you like. But what is on the tin is the uh, is the B, is the, is the inlaid yarn, which is depicted in purple on the picture. And in an off-the-shelf elastic compression garment, this is a singular layer of elastic that goes all the way up through the compression garment to give you that compression when it goes onto the limb. And this is what we see measured as class one, class two, and class three. But together, the way this material is knit is what gives us that overall um, prescription of uh, co compression on the patient's limb. So it's not just what the compression class is, it's also the thickness and the stiffness and the tension within the fabric that we're using. So we're going to need to have that at the back of our minds the whole time when we're thinking about how we're prescribing compression garments. But how do we find that out if it's not listed on the box? Truly, the only way to do that is to get familiar with the different products that are out there and the different companies that provide these that are all available on prescription um, are very, very knowledgeable and willing to come and visit you and show you the samples so that you can feel and stretch that stiffness within their range of products and also have samples so that you can then compare those to others um, as you build up your uh, portfolio or repertoire of knowledge of different compression garments out there. So then to put another spanner in the work is when we talk about class one, class two and class three, it varies depending on where the compression garments are made and in which company and area uh, of, the, of the world uh, you're buying them from. So if we look at the red on here, that's giving us um, the compression doses, if you like, uh, for class one. The purple is class two and the blue is class three. If we take um, purple, for example, or if we wanted to prescribe a, a compression garment for a patient, 
we have a huge variation. So we need to understand the levels of pressure that we want to achieve rather than just talking about class one and class two. If we look at the French um, compression class two, it starts at 15 millimeters of mercury and then look up to um, other areas of uh, Europe that produce compression and that can be as high as 32. So we're looking at a difference of 17 millimeters of mercury there, which in its own right is almost a compression class. So you need to know what dose and, and pressure you want to put on that patient's limb before you start talking about what compression class is and also where the origin of your garment is coming from and where it's manufactured generally says it on the um, on the leaflet and all compression classes will be written uh, with that number of millimetres of mercury at the side. The little picture um, just there on the screen of the lower limb shows you how much pressure is exerted in a uniform shaped limb. So if we're looking at wanting to deliver 32 millimetres of mercury compression on a limb, then you're going to achieve that around the ankle. But as we move up the limb, the pressure lessens. So that's where that knowing what the tension and the stiffness of the fabric that you're using comes into play, because um, that's going to make a big difference to how effective that garment is as it moves up the limb. It's a very soft, um, lightweight, flimsy stocking like you'd buy just um, in a supermarket or in a high street store will have um, no tension at all in it as it gets up the limb, even though there will be a little bit and um, they're not necessarily measurable. But your compression um, prescribed garments uh, are exactly the same. So if it's knit with a thick <coughs> uh, yarn and it's knit um, with a high tension, then it's going to deliver um, that stiffness as it goes up the limb, even though you're getting that um, reduction in actual millimetres of mercury compression. Hope that's not too um, complicated. So let's look at the choice considerations. Um, there's lots to think about when we're, when we're wanting to prescribe compression to patients. Firstly, let's understand the differential diagnosis. What is going on underneath the skin with that individual? Is it lymphatic in origin? Is it venous? Is it arterial? Is it a mixed etiology? Well, we may have somebody who's had lymphedema all their life, but as they age, they may see a deterioration within their venous and arterial systems. We'd certainly be looking at how we measure arterial disease before we would consider compression. And of course, we've got the guidelines now how to do that with a swollen limb on the VLS website. So please look at um, a BPI uh, document that we have. But understand that there's generally going to be a mixed etiology and that's going to have an impact on how um, patients can wear and tolerate their garments. There's generally going to be a mixed etiology and that's going to have an impact on how um, impact on how um, patients can wear and tolerate their garment too. We want to look at the nature of the edema that we've got. Is it soft and pitting and we can make our indentations? Or is it non-pitting or is it mixed? Can we pit the tissues to a certain extent and then we hit that sort of doughy, fatty, rubbery tissue feeling? Are there wounds involved? Is lymphorrhea involved? Have we got leaking of fluid coming out? All of those considerations will help us shape what we're going to choose um, that's appropriate for the patient. The biggest thing really is shape of the limb. If the, the shape of the limb is going to help you um, choose whether we go for um, an off-the-shelf garment um, that's really uniform in shape, if the leg is a uniform in shape, um, but if it's misshapen in any way, then we might need to consider doing a very tailored made-to-measure garment. It's not unusual to have the lower proportion, the distal end of the limb, to be bigger than uh, the upper limb. So we can often have a bigger forearm than upper arm. We can often have a bigger calf than a thigh. Um, so I'll show you some pictures in a minute to, to clarify that. But that's where we need to think about how is that compression going to work on that limb and what influence is it going to have and how is it going to stay on? How comfortable is it going to be? Let's talk about the goals. And the goals are not just patient goals, they're healthcare professional goals as well. But ultimately, it's a joint partnership. So that discussion together as to what you both want to achieve with what's available 
and how quick you can deliver that needs to be very realistic, particularly in today's um, environment of, of the health service. So have those goals so that we can start to think about um, what options we can go for when we're looking at compression. We've talked about the different pressures and the tensions already. So we need to think about what pressures and tensions we want to deliver. If we've had someone in a compression gown, a, a compression bandage uh, for a few days, few weeks, few months, that has been delivering anywhere between 40, 60, 80 millimetres of mercury to control the edema or heal limb, um, wounds. And then we decide to pop them in a compression stocking that's 20 to 23 millimetres of mercury. It's likely to not hold the effects of the bandage. So I'm not saying we need to start thinking about how can we achieve 80 millimetres of mercury with a, with a, or 60 millimetres of mercury with a stocking, um, uh, but we need to think about how we can start to look at materials that are available that give a good level of compression, but are also stiff and create that uh, mimic of a bandage, if you like. And there's not just stockings that do that. Think about the patients and the carer's circumstances and their ability to apply what you would ideally like that individual in and what they've chosen from your menu of uh, available compression garments. But most importantly as well is to remember your personal competencies. It is a huge scientific field in its own right is compression. Please don't guess, please don't waste money, please don't put your patients at risk. Please don't put your own professional competencies at risk. Seek advice from your lymphedema services. Um, and if you're struggling as a lymphedema service, seek advice for further education. But also ultimately contact your compression companies because they know their products inside out. Here are some typical examples of what we see coming through the door in various clinics and in the community. And we can see the differences in the shapes of limb. They're not uniform. The only one that's slightly or remotely uniform is, is the picture where the patient has got uh, some white socks on. We've got a fairly normal shaped limb. It's just considerably bigger than the other side. But look at around the knee area where we've got that huge skin fold and that area would um, if we popped an elastic circular knit stocking on that kind of gripped the leg all the way up, it would find that skin fold and it would go in, it would dig in, it would knit and it would constrict. It would definitely cause a lot of discomfort, particularly in the popliteal region, which is going to inhibit your venous and lymphatic um, return and flow and potentially make the problem much worse. And it can also cause surface skin damage and trauma. Here's some examples of um, millions of uh, compression alternatives or uh, options that are out there. We can see there's different colours, there's different styles. We can see there's garments that have got um, different shading in them. If we look at the blue one, there's less compression around the joints, but more around the thighs and the calves. There's ones with feet in, with hands in, without hands in. There's different colours. There's zip options. There's open toes. There's closed toes. There's um, neoprene wrap systems or wrap systems that don't use neoprene but use a, a non-stretch fabric. And again, refer to your um, your companies to ask for the makeup of the materials that they use within these. These wrap systems can be used on their own. They can be used instead of bandaging. They can be used over compression. They can be used as that um, immediate post bandage um, to ultimately get the patient into compression. All sorts of different combinations can be used, but be awareness of the stiffness, be awareness of the ability to apply the comfort to the patient, but make sure you're delivering the right level of prescribed um, compression to that patient. So once we've got an idea as to what's going to be a good idea to get the patient in, we need to make sure we're measuring properly. We've got the off-the-shelf standard garments that are in boxes that just come through, or we've got made-to-measure. We generally think of these as the flat-knit group, but we can get made-to-measure in the elastic ones as well. Again, we're considering the shape of the limb and the nature of the tissues the whole time we're doing this. But remembering when choosing whatever style that you go for with your compression, to take the compression beyond where the edema is, where the swelling is. 
so that it's taking it and you're not going to be pushing it right to the edge and creating a shelf or a problem of edema above where um, where that ends. So measuring for off the shelf and made to measure is individual to each company. If a patient is in an off the shelf garment and they've had uh, they're in a medium uh, regular length, please don't presume that that's the size that it would be if you're changing the compression to a different company. You can see the off the shelf garments require much less measuring than a made to measure. And they're quite um, intense and complicated and time consuming for a made to measure when you get it right it becomes like a second skin to the patient and really really effective uh, for their uh, treatment management plan uh, that you've made together but again I'm stressing go to your individual manufacturer's guidelines there, there's often videos now that you can watch that each company shows you how to measure for each of their garments correctly so lots and lots of help and tips out there for you to get that right first time for your patients the standard prescription process um, is fourfold, really, uh, if it works properly. Initially, you've got your full vascular and holistic assessment. You've identified which type of compression you want. You've measured for them. And the next thing to do is then uh, request this product from um, the GP. So a request goes to the GP. The administrator receives that, submits it to the GP. The GP signs that and the prescription is ready to go to a pharmacy or for the patient to collect to take it to a pharmacy. Um, what's really important is what's on those forms, and I'm going to go through the prescription forms for you so that that administrative process is seamless. The collection um, of garments from the pharmacy, usually if it's an off-the-shelf garment, is between 5 to 10 working days, and uh, the average is about 10 to 14 days with a made-to-measure. However, we are running uh, into some issues now, and this present in some areas is double that. Um, so it's really important when a patient is um, coming up towards the end of their six months um, of uh, wearing their garments, I've had two garments for six months, that they start that process round about the five month mark. Because when you get to your six months, your garment's out of warranty if it's been worn every day. We'd never expect a patient to take an out of date drug. So we shouldn't be expecting our patients to get to the six month mark and then set their uh, prescription process working because it's often going into seven, sometimes eight months before that garment's renewed. And a delay in that can um, re result in an increase in edema or a deterioration, particularly if there's been a wound involved, it wouldn't be unusual for that to reoccur. So start your process early enough, knowing how long things take in your area. The pharmacy gets the product from the wholesaler and then it's dispensed to the patient and the patient then owns that product. But any delay in this process, as I say, can result in a deterioration of the patient's um, uh, condition. So it's, it's vital. There's two types of compression. That, um, prescription pads, there's the green ones and the purple ones. If we're just going for a basic off-the-shelf um, in-stock garment, then we're going to go for the green. If we're going for a specific made-to-measure where we'll have the measure chart, and we'll also have the um, all the different codes for the uh, different uh, types of garment that you want, open toe, black, um, hold up, zip, all these different things require different codes. You would need to have your purple one and that's handwritten. The example um, here of the green one, we need the brand name and the type of garment. We need the compression uh, class that you've chosen, what colour, the style, is it above knee, below knee, thigh length, open toe, closed toe, um, hand piece, no hand piece if it's an upper limb, what the size is, and it's not just large, it could be large petite, it could be large regular, and how many um, quantity of garments needs to be dispatched or dispensed. I want to just bring your attention to the cost if depending on where um, which type of garment you're choosing. If you choose a British standard compression garment, then you will be charged per items in the box. So if you get a pair of stockings, you, you've got two garments and you will be charged two prescription charges. However, all the other compression garments uh, that are made elsewhere in Europe um, they are, which is to be fair, the ones that we tend to use, 
um, it's only one prescription um, per prescription. So if we have got um, a pair or two pairs, we'll still just pay that one prescription charge. Made to measure um, is generally when we're using our flat knit, but as I've mentioned before, you can get your circular knit. We're still asking for the same information on there, but you will be asking for optional extras like different colours and different uh, areas of, um, you know, there's a huge menu to choose from with the made to measure stockings. Um, so you would need to make sure there's a code for each of those and to make that process seamless for the administrator receiving it, make sure you've added all those codes onto that. Again, if you're um, wanting two garments exactly the same and the same colour, then you would just pay one prescription charge. Some patients would like black garment and they'd like a beige garment or a blue garment and a red garment. For each slight change or modification, it's a new prescription. So you would need to fill out a prescription form for each of those and you would be charged accordingly. So if you've got a black and a beige one, you'd have two prescri uh, prescription charges. If you've got two black ones, you would prescribe uh, be charged one prescription charge. Don't forget the back of the um the back of the form. It absolutely must be filled in and be mindful of the compression charges um for your uh, sorry, the prescription charges for your um for for what you're paying for so one prescription is at, currently as it stands in march 2023 it's 90 it's nine pound 15 it tends to change in april so please hint to your patients that if they're going to be using prescriptions um and this this goes for every prescription be it antibiotics eye drops creams anything that they may need it may be wise for them to get an annual prescription if they're going to do that, uh, get it in before April time because it may change and you can pay that direct debit. Please also make your patients aware that if they um, they they go out, you know, they've, they've run out, they think they're still within date and they're not. Not every pharmacist checks that when they're looking. But a patient recently who um, has um, accidentally let hers lapse, a dad picked it up because they just knew she was on a, a prepaid prescription and about three weeks later, she got a fine for £40 through the post um, because she'd let that lapse unknowingly, but she had that fine to pay and there was no arguing. Um, so please be aware that you do get fined if that's the case. I want to, um, you know, sc screenshot this if you want or um, I'll take a note of this email. This is the website you need to be keeping your eye on because everything has gone or is going electronic from a prescription perspective. And this is going to make it more difficult for made to measure garments because we don't have those options. Um, it has to be all uploaded separately, and this is where administration can run in. There are um, there are specific uh, companies out there now that can help you um, make this uh, process seamless um, for prescribing compression garments. And uh, you know, just just look out for those there. Uh, the, the regular sports of the British Lymphology Society and you'll meet them at conference. So there's lots of things in the pipeline to help make this a lot easier process. So once we've got our garments, we want our patients to wear them. We want our parents to have an easy life. Um, and there are a plethora of choices out there. There's gloves, there's easy um, slidey garments, there's um, frames where you load the garment onto and the arms can extend They'll help you put your garment on, they'll help you take your garment off. And they really all work very well towards creating independence um, for individuals and support for carers. Um, I, I've made sure our clinic has um, a selection of these to show the patients so they can choose which they want to. The ones with the long handles are very handy if the patients have difficulty getting down to their feet. The biggest tool in my kit that I could not go without are these and that's the rubber gloves if you can make sure that they've got a really good grip on them and that rubber really helps to um grab the the garment without damaging the fibers aftercare of a garment's really important and how we wash it this is what a stocking looks like when it's taken off the right way around when we turn it inside out, we can see all those skin cells stuck to the fibres of the fabric. So we need to um, 
always turn the patient's garments inside out when we wash them. Always follow the manufacturer's guidelines and never use a fabric conditioner as this degrades the uh, uh, the fibres very, very quickly and uh, it warrant, it would you would immediately lose your warranty if they found that you'd used a fabric conditioner if it was sent off for testing back to a company. So thank you for listening. I just want to conclude really that one size does not fit all. There is a massive amount of compression mm. options out there. Um, so get out there, get investigating, get learning. The outcomes of your intervention are definitely affected by the levels of compression that you choose, the stiffness of the fabric within those garments and products, the knit, the material, the cover, the site of the swelling, the fit and the appropriate application. They all have to be considered to make sure you get it right first time for your patient. Finding the right solutions, such as the application aids, uh, the wraps, um, what extras you can have within your compression garments, and the importance of understanding the patient's needs clinically, informing and ongoing support, monitoring for effective long-term management, and also socially how that affects them and the carers and the access to those services that they have around them. Accessing resources um, that are available. If you aren't attached to a lymphedema service, find your local one. Try and get those um, um, teams on board and, and they're often in a position to offer um, localised help and um, self um, little study sessions on how to get that right. And also please consider if there are any relevant um, equality and diversity issues in relation to prescribing the garments um, that you're going to be considering with your patients. So thank you and uh, very much for taking some time out to listen to this. I hope it's been helpful. Remember, webinars are available all week on Facebook and on YouTube for the Lymphedema Awareness Week campaign that the British Lymphology Society are running. And the best way to keep up to date with all the clinical resources um, is to become a member of the British Lymphology Society or to register as a friend with us. We'll make you very welcome. Thank you once again. really interesting presentation and um, we hope everyone enjoyed that um and welcome to day four of um can everyone hear me speak up speak, speak up, up. <laughs> sorry um, <laughs> um, so it was a really informative um presentation justine thank you about um, prescribing compression garments for lymphedema and how to get it right first time i mean i can't express how important this is this is for our patients um, as a lymphedema nurse myself, I just know that if we don't get this right, we don't get good outcomes for our patients. And if we don't get good outcomes, then we have obviously unhappy patients and, and more problems. So, you know, a garment that someone can't get on, that sits in a drawer, doesn't work. So it's just so important. Um, so thank you for all those hints and tips. And um, I'd just like to um, introduce myself. I'm Lorraine. I'm a lymphedema nurse and also a BLS trustee. Uh, and I'm joined today by Margaret, who you will have met earlier in the week, um, if you've tuned in to some of the other webinars. Uh, Margaret's the chair of the uh, BLS committee. Um, so during the um, presentation, we've had some questions come in. Um, so thank you. It's been very busy on the questions already, which is fantastic. I'd like to hand over to Margaret now um, for the first question. Okay, thanks, Lorraine. Um, and thanks, Justine, for that. Um, just one thing to mention, you did bring up the ABPI document that the BLS have, but just to let everybody know if you're looking for that, it's um, been withdrawn at the moment, it's been revised, and we're going to have hopefully more robust guidance for um, arterial assessment prior to compression. So look out for that, and if you are a friend, we'll let you know when that's available. But as Lorraine says, there's lots of questions. I'm going to try and pick out some, but we will try and follow up some of the others. But you did mention about the flat knit and circular knit, but a few people have asked um, a little bit more about 
why you might choose a flat knit over a circular knit garment. Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you for everybody for tuning in um, this lunchtime. Um, yeah, it's it's such a vast area and it's such a, a short amount of time to try and get so much information mm -hmm. across to you. So apologies if some of it was just skimming the surface on, on some of the areas. Um, it, it's very individual and I think I mentioned, alluded to it partly in the presentation that um, it, it very much depends on how the patient presents and what um, the picture is prior to choosing what you're going to be putting the picture, uh, patient in. So if somebody has been in bandages and you've made a huge reduction and the tissues have been pitting and uh, you've, you've had a watery swelling that you've shifted or you've healed a leg ulcer, um, you're going to need something that's going to be of a reasonable stiffness as well as a, a decent compression. So it, it's very much um, depending on, on, on what I said earlier about those um, properties, but also about looking other areas so if you remember that photograph of the lady who had a reasonably uniform shaped limb but had that huge kind of you could almost put your hand in around the knee area an elastic garment is going to nip in that so you've got skin folds and soft tissue that's quite ununiformed in shape that elastic is going to find those weak areas and it's going to be quite difficult to distribute the um the compression over that evenly so you may want to have a good level of compression, but you're probably going to need to look at a fabric that is, is um, the flat knit still delivers that level of compression, but it sits over the tissues more evenly to deliver that compression and is less likely to nip into um, those skin folds and those soft, weaker areas. So if you look at a limb, for example, we, if, we, if we think about the champagne bottle leg, um, again, that can vary in extensive um, disease and also sensitivity around the gator area and pain. If you've got an elastic stocking that's going to be um, putting a weak, sort of more compression in one area than another because of the misshape of the limb, you would be better off looking at something that's flat knit that's going to sit over that a bit more evenly. But also thinking about the nature of the tissue as well, because as lymphedema progresses, so does what's happening underneath the surface of the skin. So you might start off initially with a watery type swelling, um, but as the, the disease progresses and because of the inflammation, more fat cells get laid down in those tissues. So you end up with a, an edema that's still big and has skin changes and folds within it. Um, but actually the compression uh, that's required is really just to contain that to prevent any more watery swelling filling back up because of the lymphatic failure yeah but it's not going to make a difference on the fatty tissue um, and that's where um, a flat knit garment might be a little bit more comfortable for the patient so it, it's very complex it's it, it's all those factors that we talked about earlier um, about shape comfort um, nature of the tissues what else is presenting on the surface of the skin that helps you decide that and also application there's no reason why you can't layer up products to achieve a slightly stiffer um, outcome um, using lower levels of compression um, to get um, a, a sort of a, a better prescription for that for that limb and that's for both upper and lower limb as well so it's not a straightforward answer, I'm afraid. Um, like this leg needs to be in elastic, this leg needs to be in flat knit. It's mm -hmm. about considering all those components that you're looking at with those patients. So, hope that helps. <laughs> Thank you. No, I think that's I think that's really good, um, Justine. I'm going to follow up with another question um, before going back to Lorraine about garments because we've talked a lot about um, garments for a limb. And I appreciate it could be a whole course in itself, but a few people are asking about what's available for pelvic um, or genital edema by way of compression. Yeah, um, unfortunately, very little. Um, we do tend to talk about um, arms and legs when we talk about compression. And I did see those questions coming through as, as I was talking. Um, and some of you will know genital edema is a bit of a... Um, kind of hobby horse for me and I have been involved in the past in designing garments for the pelvic area um, sadly they're no longer available um, for patients but other things are on the market 
but it's more about containment of the swelling rather than actively reducing when you start to put things in from a pelvic point of view because you can't get those um, pressures and standards um, like you would measure a garment when it's being tested for a standard on a limb. Um, so it, it's a, a main main factor is is for comfort, but there are some there are some companies out there that have got some um, materials and, and garments that are made out of a material that is soft, has got some compression in it. But you couldn't call it a class one or a class two or a class three, but we know it's a compressive type. But it'll have lots of seams in it. It'll be um, some of them are off the of, off the shelf, some are made to measure. Some of the made to measure stockings that we get can be incorporated into um, sort of cycling shorts and into tights and pantyhose. And the, the companies that make the flat knit stockings can make the, um, the, the pelvic and um, genital area garments as well. But you need to talk to them individually and they'll be very tailored to that individual patient. There's things in Marks and Spencer's and various other companies and um, uh, and shops where you can buy these body hold things and cycling shorts, I could mention. They're off the shelf. They're made of a compressive natured material, but they're not measurable from a class perspective. So it is an area uh, uh, as practitioners that we are working on. Um, and I know there's a lot of work going on with the Welsh team on standardising how we educate people on um, uh, managing genital and pelvic um, and, and truncal edema um, as well as um, us as practitioners working with the companies to develop new products that are comfortable. At the moment there's not a huge array out there but there are things to talk to your local lymphedema specialist um, if you're in a position um, where you've got a patient or you are a patient that requires more support in that area. Okay thanks very much. Um, I'll, hand, I'll let Lorraine pick up another question. Thank you. We had a couple of questions just in about the cost. So we had one in from Rianne about um, procurement and sort of concerns that maybe cheaper products that come from around the globe. Um, is there any concern that this could affect quality of care if people are maybe choosing cheaper products? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, whatever we, wherever walk of life we go, there is always a cheap alternative from particularly a very large company that we all know made in. <laughs> um, and some of these products are great. And some of the um, European companies are actually moving some of their manufacturing processes out to other companies. I think what's important is that we use products that are uh, manufactured to a standard that we know and trust and that we are um, we have a, a duty of care to make sure that we're providing the patients with the best quality. We can't police what patients buy off the internet outside of our services and clinics. And anything that needs that goes on drug tariff has to go with a wealth of information and, and research to prove that this product meets certain standards and meets certain criteria and has research around it. So I think as long as we always stick to that and be very and question anything that comes in new, question those standards. Um, then we need to be careful. Cost is is an issue, and some of the materials and the fibres that are used to make um, the products that we get from Europe are manufactured out of Europe, South America, Asia, and there's problems with getting those across the globe and shortages of problems. I know there's been a national, uh, an international shortage of neoprim at one point. Um, so there's a huge chain of events. But actually, it comes down to the product that we choose to put on the patients. We need to be ensuring that that's got that standard that we um, are aware of, such as the LAL and the European classifications, um, that they've been through that rigorous uh, quality testing and that they've got the research behind it. So it is a concern, and as I can say, but we have some level of control over that in our professional clinics. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. The other question relating to cost that we had was about um, prescription charges um, and we had a comment about uh, for an antibiotic you wouldn't pay for every tablet, you'd pay for a pack of tablets, mm. but why with some compression garments do you have to pay per limb um, mm. for, for a stocking? Yeah, so how I understand this to be is that it's a historical 
So when compression garments first came on drug tariff in the United Kingdom, they were only from the UK and they were, uh, the, which is what we know as the British standard. And they were, um, they were, they were sold as per item and that's how it was listed initially. And that's never historically changed. Um, and then as things have moved on to drug tariff from other countries and been accepted, um, uh, that has been an opportunity to change that. So as far as I understand, it's historical. Um, and, and, and But what, what I've come across is that some pharmacists have continued that thread through to patients with the European standard garments. Um, so patients have ended up paying an awful lot of money and I know some of them have been reimbursed for that but some of them haven't. So if we know um, and arm our patients with the right information, of course this is for England, and I do know one or two comments have been coming up. In Scotland, you don't pay prescription charges. Again, it's different in Wales, I'm not quite sure about Northern Ireland. But of course, if you're a patient as well that's had cancer, then your prescription charges will be free, certainly for at least five years as well. So it, the prescription charges are local to where you live geographically, but also I, I understand the British stamp, standard is a historical one. If there's any of the um, compression companies out there or prescribing companies that are on this webinar and you've got any further comments, I'd appreciate if you could pop those in the chat for, for other people that, that would help me. Um, I'm not the ultimate expert in this, but I've got a good uh, understanding over the last 30 years as to how this is um, manifest. So that's hopefully thank that. you, thank you, Justine. That's really helpful, and I think it is a really common problem actually. And, I, and I've had the same experience in that I've had patients charged more than they should have done um, from pharmacies that innocently thought that was the right thing to do, and I've got the patient to go back to the pharmacy and similar being reimbursed. Um, and before I hand back to Margaret, there's a comment from Robert in the questions. He says it's more of a statement really about making sure that your measurement forms get sent on to the manufacturers from the the GP and, and I feel your pain Robert because it's something that we definitely have struggled with um, in our service and we've actually switched how we do our prescriptions as a result of that using a sort of specialist pharmacy and we found that um, works better rather than trying to use every GP's pharmacy that's just in our lymphedema service how we do things um, because it is um, something that can just you know it can cause delays and then you get the wrong garments and it's something which um, locally just needs to be addressed best as possible. So thank you for raising that, Robert. Right, if I can follow on from that as well, Lorraine, um, another thing that I've done is, yeah, I would recommend using some of the online pharmacists that specialise in um, the lymphatic um, compression or in compression and anything to do with that. But also where I know where certain pharmacists have that and GP surgeries have had that problem, I always give the patients a copy of their made-to-measure form mm. as well as a second backup so there's the one that goes off to the gp and i always give a copy to the patients either electronically if they're given permission from a gdpr perspective to email them or as a print off in the clinic so that they they take some control and charge over that as well to, to make sure because there's no one that wants their prescription absolutely bang on more than the patient they want that more than us um, with the purse strings in the clinics so um arming your patients with a little bit of a uh, piece of paper often goes along there as well so thank you i'll hand back over to margaret now okay uh, thanks um uh, someone's asking about um alternatives to um bandaging really seeing compression garments and um, the gold standard for reducing and um, swelling initially but the patient if the patient cannot commit would you suggest compression wraps or teach the patient to self-bandage um potentially all of those um again it's down to the individual um and their um, ability to self-manage and willingness to self-manage but also to to consider their condition um have they got leaking have they got an open wound um have they got uh, an unusual shape that needs reshaping uh, and also to the extent of the edema where it is um how what you don't want to do is is make one area worse uh, by just using one product in a certain area so for example if you just used a wrap system around the calf what's happening above that and what's happening distal to that so that would the foot get worse 
there are wrap systems for the feet um, is that appropriate or are they able to still put their work shoes and boots on if you're going to get them to do that um, so there's lots of ifs and buts but there are lots of little packages of care that you can tailor to those individuals beauty about having a lymphedema service with access to bandages wrap systems um made to measure garments elastic off the shelf garments and various things he's he's just seen it as a as a toolbox understanding what each product does individually but understanding what they do if you start to combine them and tailor that to that individual um mm -hmm. and circumstances and that really goes a long way for helping patients to self-manage um their conditions so if you're confident and competent enough to teach somebody how to self-bandage then that's a very realistic option um, but there are various things that pa patients can use at various times of the day they may wear um, a stocking with a wrap system over through the day and then at night there's uh, there's nighttime and evening um, compression products that you can go into that just take the pressure off that but are still equally useful but a, 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 le a less restricting um, and work better when you're resting rather than when you're moving and getting that exercise and working and resting pressures so it's um it's a combination so there's lots of options for those individuals it's, it's about knowing your competencies and understanding what the patient's capable of and working in that unique partnership that you're very privileged to be in um, you've kind of asked answered that the next question i was going to raise because somebody had asked about is it possible to wear uh, daytime garments and nighttime garments so I think you've more or less answered it unless you want to add anything else about nighttime garments yeah I think um some of the work that um, I've been involved in and written a couple of papers on about nighttime compression is that uh, the big thing for patients at night time is comfort um the last thing we want to do is keep somebody awake because if we increase their levels of fatigue then they're going to be uh, incredibly uh, grumpy, fall out with us, fall out the compression. Um, and actually the problem could be a lot worse by the end of it. So that often means going into something slightly lighter at night um, or less compressive or less um, stiff, stiffer, if you like. Um, so I sometimes have patients who um, will choose to go into proper nighttime garments that are not on prescription but are willing to pay for those and they are manufactured to a fantastic standard and, and materials and innovation innovative products but they, they come with a price tag and i have patients who have found it um very comfortable and very realistic and very well managed to go in an older garment overnight and be wearing their new um stiffer garments um when they're busy and active and they're wearing an older one at night so they're still having that containment but it's just slightly slacker and as long as it's to a reasonable standard um it's not got holes in and laddered and fraying everywhere so um yeah that's that's the only thing that i would add is that sometimes it's it's more about comfort and, um, and containment uh, for the patients but it doesn't work for everybody um and and it's important that the patients have a choice in that as well okay thanks and lorraine thank you margaret um, Justin, we've got an interesting question about if you've got a patient that um, doesn't really need a made-to-measure garment, but they don't quite fit the standard garment. Um, so it's saying, is there a manufacturer that offers more choice in terms of long, short, these kind of things? Um, and I know there are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, but there's a plethora out there and that is available isn't it Justin I just don't know where we stand with saying the actual manufacturers um, yeah no we can't say the actual manufacturers and that's why it's important that if you are in a position as a professional where you're going to be requesting that patients go into um, compression or you're working with that patient that's going to be putting it in prescribing it recommending it that you go and have these conversations with all these different companies the majority of people that have the off-the-shelf products uh, do do a range of lengths so there will be petite they'll be regular they'll be long but if you are wanting anything that's beyond the standard of those that are off off the shelf uh, in those still uh, and then there's ones that will do uh, extra wide calf and extra wide uh, thighs mm -hmm. as well and um, so there's there's a whole range of those but if you're going beyond those limits of off the shelf then you are going into a made to measure and again it doesn't have to be flat knit it can still be circular knit 
Um, so look at the um, product catalogues that the companies have. Um, they are very, very knowledgeable and they, they have a huge array um, of options for you and can often help and advise. Many of the people that work in these companies have been lymphedema um, specialists in, in a previous life as well. So uh, they'll be knowledgeable from a, a professional basis as well. Um, so uh, work together um, rather than seeing them as a, a, a company that's trying to sell us something. You know, work together to get the best uh, option for your patients. Um, we had a comment about um, why are there so many different compression classes? Why can't it just be uniform? Um, I know you can't solve that one for us, Justine. <laughs> the answer, well, answer is very clear because we are all individual. And we, we if we had one... No, sorry, the question was about why have we got RAL and why have we got AFNO and why have we got British Standards? So why can't the Class 1 be standard and Class 2 be standard? I think that's what the um, question meant. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Political question. <laughs> all the um, all the companies that are sat on the webinar now will be going answer that one. Just to yeah. <laughs> there is a history behind all of that, and there's been historically a certain um, number of um, compression companies got together initially to standardise, and then other companies have come on board, and they have their own standards. Uh, so long as they are all meeting that same quality that when they say that their product is this compression and we've got the evidence to prove that it is, then uh, we don't really need that everybody doing the same thing. So long as they are all um, practicing to a standard that's of a, a quality and they, they can demonstrate that um, with the research behind it. Um, you know, we want choice. We want these different things that are available, but we also want quality and we also want standards. So they are, um, it, it goes back pre-war to some, some of these standards. So it, it is, it's just something that's, that's come along and it's political and I don't want to get involved in that conversation. <laughs> but so as long as you know that the products that you're putting on your patients are of the high quality standard and have been tested and that they deliver what they say on the tin, then you are fine and you can relax about it. Shall I hand back to you, Margaret? Uh, yeah, I know we're running out of time and I think there's no easy answer to this one um, either, Justine, but I thought it useful to acknowledge it about um, from Christy about referring to you saying that um, prescribers should try and get patients into garments early if they've got mild swelling so that it, they might not need to be in, in compression forever. And what can they do as a patient to ensure that good practice is implemented? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's a tough one because it's what is the origin of the swelling. And unless, if we, can, if we can influence the underlying cause, then there may be an opportunity to take somebody out of compression in the long run. So if it's a venous problem that can be rectified, then somebody may need stockings for a short period of time, surgery, and they may not need it afterwards. If it's a genetic a primary a, um, congenital lymphedema, then we're not going to rectify that. At this stage, as we are in the world today, there is work and there's science going on to look at once we've, now we've cracked the genetic code of some of these primary lymphedemas, there's an opportunity for us then to start to decode them and get medications that may one day provide um, a change in the way we manage and that that might start to resolve the genetics and, and the problems. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet with that by a long shot. And surgery is mm -hmm. only an answer for some patients and surgery is uh, not necessarily, even if it is an answer, it's not necessarily a long-term answer. Certain things like liposuction mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily take away and rectify the underlying cause. It just makes them smaller and more manageable. Um, so it, it's very much about um, whether you, um, I mean, and also certain things from like a breast cancer related lymphedema, should we be getting somebody in the minute they see a swelling? There's work going on, and I know Eunice Jeff's doing a huge amount of work on early intervention for her PhD. Um, the evidence is still very low on that, but gut instinct does tell us and practice does tell us to, um, where we've seen that happen. Um, but then it, it's also about where that patient is on that journey of rehabilitation as well. We start telling them they've got a garment to wear at this stage. Um, what 
is that going to tip them over the edge? Is that going to really help them? Because at some point we can't guarantee that they won't come out of it. Uh, we can't guarantee that it's going to make it any better. It might still continue to get worse because of all the underlying disease processes that are going on. Mm. So that again, you're right, Margaret, it's not an easy answer. And it is about yeah. that going down for that deep differential diagnosis and understanding of that individual. Mm -hmm. If patients are wanting to buy their own garments because we can't give absolutely everybody everything um, free forever, um, there are the online um, lymphedema specialist um, um, companies that we can run our prescriptions through, but also patients can buy those extra top up. Mm -hmm. So they can yeah. um, try different products and garments themselves if they want to. And there's lots of, well, I said lots, there's two or three of those. Um, that we that are our go-to uh, companies um, so you can advise patients to look into and guide them the right way rather than going to the yeah. things on Amazon. I think um, it's, I don't know if anybody I else. Think it a, I think it was maybe I think it was maybe I think that was all really useful um, guidance because their day is different um, I guess it's maybe partly if somebody's got very mild swelling about how they make sure they get compression early because and I'm reading, I might be wrong. It may be that somebody's been fobbed off by uh, being told, oh, it's just mild swelling. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in my book, that's the time to get it because um, you know we yeah. can reverse that inflammation episode that's going. It's not an inflammatory um, episode that they're having like cellulitis, but the tissue are the tissues are going to have a level of inflammation. Lymphedema is an inflammatory disease in its own right. The earlier we can start to influence that and get rid of the fluid that's in that limb, the better. Um, I guess if they get into a lymphedema service, they should be being offered that. Um, and, and I would just, the, the patients that tend to get what they want are the ones that tend to be persistent and push. Um, but we haven't got, as far as aware, nothing that tells us that we should be absolutely doing that. But as lymphedema yeah. professionals, we do recommend early intervention where possible um so yeah it's okay. and it's postcode lottery isn't it as to where patients go yeah. Yeah. thank you yeah. i suppose giving rationale for the underlying um tissues and disease progression will get you what you want if you don't give rational if you just ask for something uh, you don't like yeah. to know but if you give some good clinical rationale yeah. it's evidence-based then yeah. you're likely to succeed okay. thank you yeah, but this was from a patient point of view, and I think they can only just keep asking, you know, and not be fogged off. But yeah. it isn't, it's yeah. not, it is so difficult. Then please keep pushing, you, you deserve to yeah. get that. Yeah. I think that okay. brings us to an end. Um, our hour is up. Um, it's been a really informative hour. Thank you so much, Justine. I'm conscious that we haven't answered all the questions, and there's a question about ABPI and putting people into compression in the ch in the questions and that's definitely one we'd like to follow up on in our news and views and um, we've got a new document coming out that will address that as well not something that we can answer succinctly here um, so again thank you big thank you to Justine for giving up her time to present to us today um, just to say that all of you that have attended you'll have access to this um, again you'll get sent a link and there will also be the BLS YouTube channel that will be opening up sometime um, in the spring um, so you'll get if you sign up as a friend then you'll be have access to that and get sent the links to that so please do look at um, www.thebls.com and you can sign up as a friend um, just wanted to mention we've got a webinar this evening as well 7 30 this evening a related webinar also about compression garments um, so please do tune in for that it goes in it complements this one goes into lots of practical elements of, um, of wearing compression um, so just a big thank you to all our sponsors that have made these webinars possible, to Haddenham Healthcare, to Essity and to Juzo. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to um, put these um, webinars on this week. Um, and just to mention, we've also got all our resources on the BLS website. Um, so if you do take a look, if you wanted to find out more, um, we've got fact sheets in the resources section of the BLS website. Um, so please do check that out. Thank you again to Justine. Thank you to Margaret. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>